Hey friends, welcome to History Savvy. Today, I'm going to be looking at a video from the armchair historian about what life was like in communist East Germany. Now, East Germany, of course, was a country that was created out of the ashes of World War II, and it grew up under the parentage of Soviet Russia. East Germany was also a kind of Soviet showcase for communism and uh, a bulwark against Western capitalism. Now, I'm interested to see what topics the armchair historian chooses to focus on in his narrative here. I personally hope he'll talk something about television and mass media as a means of shaping opinions about socialism, um, even down to children. I have here a, a special guest, I guess you could call him. This is Das Sandmännchen. He's an East German children's character that started in the late, like the very end of the 1950s, ran through the 60s, 70s, 80, and is still on TV today uh, on a program called Unser Sandmännchen. So he's called the Little Sandman. So I hope we'll talk something about television. Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of people today alive who grew up in the DDR. The DDR stands for uh, Deutsche Demokratische Republik. And so some of these people have feelings of nostalgia for their life in the DDR. And the Germans have a word for this. It's called Ostalgie. It's a mix between East and nostalgia in German. So it's, it's a kind of a, a fun or funny little social phenomenon in, in Germany today. So without further ado, let's get into it. It is August 1945, and the guns have gone silent across Europe. The Third Reich is no more, its ambitions crushed beneath the overwhelming power of the Allied nations and Comintern. Yet amidst the ruins, people still remain. Although battered and beaten, the hardy German spirit still endures, but unbeknownst to them. So speaking about the hardy German spirit, as he phrased it there, uh, it reminds me of a comment I heard once from a, an American vet of World War II who talked about how the Germans tended to reconstruct or at least recover rubble and things out of bombed cities starting even the day after uh, a bombing happened. And that's in contrast to other countries. Uh, he specifically mentioned France, where he said that even months after combat had moved on from the area, Things still lay in rubble. So I found that interesting. But speaking about Berlin in the immediate days after the surrender, Berlin was still a real beehive of activity. There are a lot of films, and you could find them here in, in YouTube land. These films were taken by uh, the Allies, and they just showcase occupation forces people coming and going and moving around Berlin, people pushing carts, even riding, you know, motorcycles, bicycles, cars. Life was in a sense rebounding from the devastation that the Berliners had experienced at the end of the war. So there, obviously there was no money, there was a barter economy going on. So there was a lot of people living in Berlin and they were trying to reconstruct their lives as best they could at this point. I find it interesting that not even six months after the war ended, uh, there were film companies in Germany, especially Berlin, that began producing films in the rubble of Berlin. These films are called Trümmer Filme. And a lot of them, at least the ones I've seen, have focused on the experiences and lives of children in in the rubble of Berlin. I think the most famous one's called Irgendwo in Berlin. And um, it deals with uh, a father coming home who has PTSD and the family trying to cobble itself together after experiencing the war. There's a lot of children, they're playing uh, in and amongst the rubble, the social interactions between these children, and they're playing and they scramble up the ruins of a building up to a really high point and in a really sad moment one child falls off to his death so spoiler alert there 
But these trauma filme uh, really give you a glimpse into what life was like, at least in Berlin, in the, in the immediate days after the end of the war. They are about to become pawns in an even greater war, one fought not with guns and bombs, but with economics and ideology. At the Potsdam Conference, Germany was divided between the Allied powers. With the stroke of a pen, 16 million people fell under Soviet dominion. The, so the Potsdam Conference happened in June, July 1945 in the city of Potsdam, which is not too far from Berlin. It was attended by President Truman, Prime Minister Churchill, and then the Prime Minister who followed him, I can't remember his name right now, and Joseph Stalin. Now, this conference was, in a sense, a way of, of reassuring or reaffirming agreements that had been made in previous conferences and meetings between the respective countries' diplomats. It was also at the Potsdam Conference that President Truman gave the green light to go ahead and prepare to drop the bomb, the nuclear bombs, on Japan. The two halves of the nation would now stand at odds. On one side, a capitalist buffer state against the menace of communism. On the other, a glorious socialist utopia. At least, that was the theory. Great intro. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In today's video, we're going to take a look at what life was like in the German Democratic Republic, also known as East Germany. This Soviet puppet state imagined itself as a glorious communist utopia, while Western propaganda painted it as a nightmarish dystopia. As is so often the case, the truth is more complicated, and lies somewhere between these two envisioned extremes. Before we begin today's video, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Honey. Thanks to the pandemic, being able to save while shopping online has become a real section below, or go to joinhoney.com armchair. As soon as the Soviets began their occupation, they treated their new subjects harshly. The defeated populace could only watch as Russian soldiers rapidly dismantled what little remained of their industrial infrastructure and shipped it back to Russia. Tens of thousands... So the Soviets did that as a means of gaining some kind of reparation from the Germans because the German money was, was no good, obviously. And the Soviets were 100% keen on getting their money back, essentially. And the Allies were less keen on exacting reparations because of the lesson they had learned from World War I. Of suspected Nazi sympathizers or anti-communists were rounded up and imprisoned at repurposed concentration camps. Simultaneously. So it wasn't only local political prisoners, but also huge numbers of the Wehrmacht and German army that were taken into concentration camps and gulags across Soviet-controlled territory. And some of these men did not return to Germany until over 10 years after the end of the war. The Soviets set to work laying the political foundations for a communist regime in East Germany. In 1946, the occupiers forcibly merged two German political parties, the Communist Party and the Social Democratic Party, to form the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, or SED. The SED was quickly purged of all opponents of Stalinism and was then installed as the sole ruling party in the new government. In so the SED being made up of the Communist Party and the Social Democrats um, I would presume more of the Social Democrats were uh, purged than the Communists. The reason for that being the Social Democrats were and had always been more moderate in policy than the Communists had been. Uh, the Social Democrats have kind of not had a great run of it uh, up to this point in German history. As they were growing as a political party in the early part, the very end of the Kaiserreich, and then they were put immediately into power and suddenly into power at the end of World War I. Uh, they were the ones to be running the Weimar Republic and then be, you know, decimated by the Nazis. And so here they are being put back into power, but presumably being swallowed up by uh, more radical, like hardline communist thinking. <laughs> 
In October of 1949, the Soviets formally turned over political control over their occupied zone to the SED. So let's read a little uh, blurb here. While the GDR was nominally independent, it was a practice. It was in practice a satellite state of the USSR, right? Soviet troops remained in the country, and the SED's policy decisions could be overridden by the Soviet government. That's 100% true, and that's something that became relevant around the death of Stalin in the early 1950s. So uh, the independence of East Germany was always kind of a sore spot uh, for East German government officials as they wanted to be viewed as equals, and they simply weren't, neither by the Soviets or the Americans. Establishing the German, air quotes, Democratic Republic, or GDR, as a new, air quotes, independent nation. From the moment of its creation, East Germany and its people were faced with tremendous hardship. The western portion of Germany, namely the Ruhr Valley, had always been the industrial heart of the nation, and its loss left the GDR with almost no industrial capacity. This resulted in devastating shortages of most essential goods, and the population suffered from severe malnourishment. With nothing available to purchase, laborers had no incentive to work, which caused the economy to stagnate even further. As so, like I said before, there was not much of an economy as we would know it. It was a barter economy, and cigarettes were a, a kind of currency at this time too. Black markets thrived. I know in West Germany, the Allied governments put people to work and paid them to basically clean up the rubble, to find furniture that was usable and could be resold, to find usable bricks, stack them for uh, reconstruction, things like that. I don't know if the Soviets did something similar in East Germany, but uh, apparently not. As the beleaguered citizens of East Germany struggled to survive, their former countrymen in the West were already experiencing economic recovery. Schont und schützt eure Anlage. Sie wurde im Berliner Notprogramm Marshallplan Hilfe. Thanks to the American aid under what was called the Marshall Plan. When news of this supposed prosperity reached the GDR, desperate people began to flee to the West in the tens of thousands. The mass exodus from East Germany only worsened its economic conditions. So before we get too much further, I want to talk a minute about the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was not limited to Germany. Um, it was offered to any country that uh, was kind of resisting communist influence. And in the case of Czechoslovakia, which had a legitimately elected communist government, the government wanted to accept Marshall Plan help. Uh, that was until their leader was summoned to visit Joseph Stalin, and then magically after that, the Czechoslovakians no longer wanted Marshall Plan help. But in the case of Greece, Marshall Plan help came in the form of Missouri mules used to uh, help farmers uh, plant crops and things, tractors as well. That was something highly... Uh, effective and even unusual especially in the case of mules these these there's a greek farmer who's on the record saying like wow these mules are huge compared to ours they just weren't used to it um in italy there were it wasn't just money and food that was received but it was also auto manufacturing equipment from detroit that helped restart companies like fiat um, in Italy, the Marshall Plan was also essential in preventing a communist government being voted into power in Italy. So um, the Marshall Plan was a huge, huge success and really did a lot to help stabilize European economies. As a young people... But, oh, I should also mention that the Soviets also had their version of the Marshall Plan that they, they focused in Eastern Europe and their spheres of influence. Skilled laborers and intellectuals vacated the country in droves. The SED attempted to counteract this brain drain with aggressive propaganda campaigns, framing the decision to leave East Germany as an act of political and moral backwardness and depravity. But there was nothing physically stopping people from leaving, and so the exodus continued. 
The task of halting this flow of emigration and reviving the economy fell to General Secretary of the SED, Walter Olbricht. In 1952, Olbricht decided that in order to accomplish this goal, he needed to follow the example of the USSR by rapidly converting East Germany into a proper communist society using a good old five-year plan. Classic, yeah, five-year plans always seem to be the, the solution to every communist problem. But the Sovietization of East Germany was a slow process. Um, the Soviets had, could, they could take from their own history in knowing that it wasn't wise to immediately communize and Sovietize industries. It was better to let capitalism work, build it up, and then take it over. Um, in the early days of the Soviet Union, Lenin allowed this to happen. So uh, this same sort of strategy was employed uh, here in Germany. I don't know if they were specifically thinking like, well, we did this with Lenin, let's do this with the Germans. Uh, but that seems uh, possible. It, it, it makes sense in its own way. In carrying out this plan, Olbricht demonstrated that he had truly embraced the teachings of Stalin by successfully starving his people even further and making everything much, much worse. His attempts to collectivize agriculture led to disastrous food shortages, and the high taxes on private enterprise caused those consumer goods, which had crept back onto the shelves, to disappear once again. The party tried to compensate for these new shortages by increasing worker quotas, requiring 10% more effort to earn the same wages. This last burden finally pushed people over the edge, and hundreds of thousands more fled to the West. In the summer of 1953, even after the Soviets had forced Olbricht to dial back most of his collectivization efforts, a worker strike broke out in East Berlin, which quickly grew into a protest demanding free elections and other reforms. The movement soon spread. So that's a lot to unpack in just a, a few short years here. So uh, the, the five-year plan and the accelerization of Sovietization in East Germany was due in part to uh, Ulbricht thinking that he had a green light to really push it and Sovietize East Germany. This was after Stalin had sent a note to the Western countries saying, hey, you know what, why don't we let East and West Germany unify? But to do that, you have to agree to uh, basically demilitarize them and make them neutral. And the Western allies said, no, we don't want to do that. If they unify, that's fine, but we want it to be its own independent nation and allow it to do as it pleases on the world stage. There is... A, a debate in history about how sincere was Stalin in that note. Did he genuinely want Germany to unify and be a neutral state or not? I think looking at Stalin in the context of his acts uh, and broader life, no, he was not sincere. He was looking for a way to include all of Germany in a Soviet sphere of, in, of influence. So, uh, the five-year plan didn't go too well. Uh, part of the reason was farmers left East Germany, and that left huge amounts of land fallow, which led to the food shortages. The consumer goods uh, were really expensive and hard to come by. The government subsidies were drying up because East Germany was subsidizing its people, and that was part of why they wanted them to work longer hours and produce more was to offset costs. And so the, just basically what happened was the cost of living increased and people couldn't afford it. They were working overtime to try and make ends meet and then they couldn't work overtime anymore because the government said, no, you can't do that. We need to defray costs here. So that led to uh, the five-year plan combined with the, the work policies from Ulbricht led to this uprising. And the Soviet, as was mentioned here, the Soviet leadership after the death of Stalin said, yeah, tone it back. Don't persecute um, bourgeoisie industry. Tone it back on the Protestants and things. But they didn't say anything about the mandatory extra 10% uh, production. And so that was still a big 
a big problem. And in the end, people bl blamed Ulbricht for failing them. Spread across the country, and within days, 340,000 people were protesting in every city and almost every large town in East Germany. The situation was dire enough that Ulbricht was forced to call on the Soviets for help. And it also, I should mention the way the protesters legitimized their actions. They said, we are the ones who are defending true socialism, and not you. You failed it. We are the ones who want to, to save it, to make it work, and free elections should be a part of that. So there was a, a, a newspaper that just shredded um, Ulbricht and his choices in the five-year plan and the choices he made in 1953. It was only upon the arrival of their tanks and armed soldiers that the unrest was finally quelled. And so migration to the West continued. By the beginning of the 1960s, nearly 4 million people had fled the GDR since its foundation, representing over a quarter of the country's original population. Party officials tried several tactics to keep people from escaping, including fortifying their border with West Germany. But citizens continued to flee through Berlin. Due to its unusual status as a single city divided between Soviet East and Allied West, it was difficult to stop people from crossing the border, turning the former capital into a city-sized loophole through which over 90% of the migrants fleeing East Germany were able to escape. By 1961, the party had had enough, and finally decided to close the border with the construction of the Berlin Wall. This 156-kilometer, or 97-mile barrier, effectively cut off the people of East Germany from the West. Where nearly 4 million had escaped since 1949, only 5,000 more would manage to abscond over the next 30 years. As the 1960s progressed, quality of life slowly improved in the GDR. After losing a quarter of their number, the remaining population of the nation slowly realized that there was no longer a shortage of housing or jobs. Production of consumer goods and strategic resources gradually increased, and by the end of the decade, East Germany had the richest economy in the Eastern Bloc. But while more goods were being produced, not everything was consistently available. The government was in control of all production. The resulting fluctuations led to massive lines outside of stores and the widespread hoarding of common goods. Those without access to hard currency from the West were subject to the whims of the party's economic planners, and often had to wait months or even years for certain goods to become available. For example, those wishing to purchase a sleek, stylish, high-performing East German automobile would have no trouble paying for it, but they would have to wait up to 13 years to actually receive their vehicle. <laughs> That's true. Um, what you see here on screen is a Trabant. It's a famous East German car, more affectionately known as a Trabi. And I know, uh, I met a couple who grew up and lived in Berlin, in East Berlin. And they talked about how one of their neighbors was a doctor. And their doctor made house calls. And he wanted to make it easier on himself, so he, he requested a car. It took him five years to finally get a car. And then after that, he wasn't able to use it. The reason for that was he couldn't get the gas for it. Even that was um, rationed in a sense. So yeah, life was, was harder thanks to government intervention in, intervention in the economy. The banana in East Germany, I think, is a kind of subtle symbol as this very same couple who talked about their doctor neighbor, also talked about bananas being a highly desirable commodity. And uh, if somebody visited the West or traveled from the West, family members or something, they would often bring bananas as a very special treat. He also talked about if you wanted, if you, if you were at the shops, at the store, and you saw something on the shelf that you might need in the future, but you didn't need right now, you just got it. Because... You never would know when it would be back on the shelf. Despite the long waits, standards of living in East Germany did improve significantly in the 1960s, but unrest and opposition to the communist government remained. Despite ongoing discontent, there was never another widespread rebellion like the 1953 uprising until the Soviet Union began to collapse. 
This effective suppression of unrest was all thanks to the Ministry of State Security, also known as the Stasi. The Stasi was one of the most feared secret police forces in the Eastern Bloc. And the so, I want to talk about where the name Stasi came from. Let's see if it goes, I think it says here. Yep. Ministerium für Staatssicherheit. So, Stasi is a truncation of Staatssicherheit Polizei. And uh, you also, that's common throughout the Germans in the 20th century. Gestapo was a, a truncation of Geheim Staatspolizei. Um, Nazi, National Socialist. Uh, Zozi, as was a social democrat, a socialist. So, uh, anyway, just point is, uh, Stasi is a, is a truncation of Staatssicherheitspolizei, literally meaning state security police. One of the most feared secret police forces in the Eastern Bloc. And between their founding in 1950 and their dissolution after German reunification, they carried out one of the most extensive mass surveillance programs in the pre-digital age. They employed over 170,000 informants among the civilian population, although some estimates suggest there could have been as many as half a million. There were Stasi agents in every apartment building, every factory, every hospital and university, watching and listening for any sign of subversive or anti-communist behavior. Until 1970, dissidents identified by this surveillance network were simply arrested, dragged off somewhere, and tortured until they gave up any accomplices before being imprisoned. In the 1970s, the Stasi decided that these methods were too crude and began to employ a form of psychological warfare called Zersetzung, which literally means decomposition. These insidious tactics and mass surveillance created a culture of suspicion and fear in much of the East German populace. The eyes of the Stasi were everywhere. Yeah, that's true. Um, the Stasi were everywhere, and after the Germanys unified, uh, the Stasi records were made available and open, and a lot of people were astonished at who it was who denounced them and who was Stasi informants. It was it was an absolute shock. And the tactics the East German state used to punish non-believers or dissidents um, was, as like the little blurb there mentioned, uh... Smear campaigns, making them public pariahs, uh, taking away their jobs, demoting them. Basically, they weren't able to, making them unable to make any kind of money uh, to discipline them. So it wasn't always just locked room and tortures and things and, you know, Gestapo talk, tactics. It was smearing them, making them social pariahs, um, moving them around, alienating their family, things like that. Despite this pervasive fear of Stasi surveillance and harsh state censorship, a vibrant and distinct art and material culture flourished in the GDR. The identity that developed within these restrictions was defined largely in opposition to the West, emphasizing the ways in which the people of East Germany were distinct from and of course superior to those in the West. Movies and plays produced by the state-owned studios and theaters celebrated the ordinary working-class heroes of socialism, along with brave underdogs who fought against fascism and imperialism. When it came to women... So yeah, they did mention television and its effects. So going back to the Sen mention here, um, he, he was a little puppet, a little claymation puppet guy. Uh, he was shown traveling to space uh, as a cosmonaut. In fact, when the, the Soviets did send cosmonauts up and they were in orbit, they brought a little Sen mention here to show East German children. Um, he flew in the show. He showcased you know, technological advancements that were made in under communism and socialism. He was seen traveling to other lands and just spreading the the goodness of socialism and the peace that it represented. Women's rights, East Germany rejected the traditional conservative gender rules still enforced in West Germany in favor for greater autonomy for women in marriage and in the workplace. Birth control was more widely accepted and available, and women were encouraged to participate in the workplace rather than remaining at home. Uh, that's 
I think that's a pretty generous interpretation of how women were thought of in East Germany. Um, the creation of a healthy proletariat family in Marxist theory relies on a man and a woman having a stable relationship in which to raise children in. And if you could get that, you would have a steady supply of, of people for the socialist or the, the proletarian, what's the word I'm looking here? You would have a stable state and a stable economy, basically. And the state provided full day daycare for children. So it was incredibly easy for mothers to go work at the factory, work full time, and uh, leave their children to the care of the state. And these daycares were pretty stinking strict. Uh, you can see an example of what it would have looked like and what it was like in the East German Museum in Berlin. Um, they had like communal potty sessions where children all had to go to the bathroom at the same time together. This was an exercise to show we need to be one unit. We are one. There's no individuals here. There's just one people, one unit. So having women go outside of the home and work was another tactic at strengthening socialist thought in East Germany. This anti-Western pro-communist cultural movement took hold most strongly among the older generation, while the youth, as they often do, chose to rebel. In the late 1970s and 80s, as the governments of both German nations were pushing for reconciliation and greater cooperation, cultural influences from the West began to seep in and catch on with the younger generation. Punk and rock music became popular, and tech-savvy teenagers became fascinated by Western video games. This created a cultural divide in the GDR, with the old guard still stubbornly in support of the communist system that kept them fed, sheltered, and employed, while young, educated East Germans grew more and more fascinated with the West and opposed the status quo. Now, I don't think this, this was a scene that you would have seen in any East German home. Um, Western pop culture items were pretty much taboo like if you there's i've heard stories of of people like saving up all their money to buy a smuggled record of a michael jackson album and they would play it secretly i mean you couldn't listen to west german programs I, this was you just couldn't sit down with your rubik's cube and play pong as an east german youth the the punk hairstyles absolutely that's that's not happening you know so this is definitely a, a Western scene we're looking at here. By 1989, discontent with the communist policies erupted into widespread protests for the first time since 1953. And this time, the Soviet army was in no position to intervene. In November, the Berlin Wall was taken down and the SED abolished the provision in the constitution guaranteeing communist control of the government. The following year, East and West Germany were eine Welt ohne Militär, es gibt die something Teilung durch so, uh, it's formally reunited. The reunification of Germany was met with approval from both sides of the old border, but the divisions between the two halves of this new nation did not disappear overnight. No, Many no. factories in the east were closed, and widespread unemployment reappeared for the first time in decades. For many, particularly less educated men who had lost the stable jobs they'd enjoyed in the communist era, there was a sense that the West had finally won, and the East was now getting left behind. But there was a huge investment in the East as well to kind of bring it up to speed. Um, if you were an East German and you traveled to West Germany, you were given like an amount of money as a welcome gift. You know, and so there's stories about people trying to get their hands on as much welcome money as they can. There was a, a real open arm policy amongst West Germans to the East Germans, and not all East Germans were enthusiastic about uh, unifying under a West German uh, capitalist system. <laughs> 
Even to this day, many Germans in the East feel a sense of nostalgia for the days of the GDR, Ostalgie. when everyone enjoyed, if not prosperity, at least stability and solidarity within the communist system. While most historians acknowledge that East Germany was a repressive dictatorship, there are still Germans today who remember it fondly and identify more as East Germans than Germans. As always, it is impossible to simply classify a nation or its people one way or the other. Fair enough. I guess I'll just share one last story uh, from this couple whom I mentioned earlier. Uh, her brother just disappeared one day, and everybody kind of assumed that he had been taken in by the Stasi. Well, months go by, and all of a sudden he appears in West Germany, broadcast on West German TV. And they received the, they watched the program on TV, and with, within minutes of the broadcast going live, the Stasi were at this couple's apartment door and took them into custody and um, interrogated them, looking to find out how exactly did he get from East Berlin to West Berlin. And they had no idea. He kept it totally secret. Later, they found out that he had gone uh, into Eastern Europe, down through Austria, and then up into West Germany that way. But the the fact that the Stasi could be in to your apartment door within minutes, and bring you in and hold you for interrogation for your brother going on a trip, is is astonishing. And I think that's just one great example if it's not a harsh example of how repressive east germany was so anyway i'd like to thank you for watching i hope you've enjoyed the the video the video is is was really great uh really well researched the pacing was great like the animation i look forward to doing more of their videos in the future and i hope you watch more of mine so thank you for watching and i'll catch you in the next one